Um, who wants to be a real comic and um, who is just doing this to gain a better perspective on public speaking and comedy in general? Anybody like that? What, really? For real? You don't want to be a comedian? I just want to have fun and hang out with cool people. Kick ass. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not here for um, anything else. Hey, you're from... Uh, yeah, because I'm from the radio. You always come in. You always yeah, come man. Like that, so. I love Paul and Ron. They're hilarious. I'm here to save my life. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. What? You know, the graver this. You know, I think this is better. <laughs> no? <laughs> you, you haven't waited on a Tuesday on the part of the factory. Okay? That's when you'll think you'll reconsider it all. You'll be like, oh, fuck it. I'll take death. <laughs> I'm gonna get hurt. Good inspiration, thank you. Well, no worries. I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here to give you real shit. You know? I mean, you guys uh, pay a ton of dough, and I'm trying to make it worth it for you. Um, uh, by the way, uh, I will talk. Uh, I, just so you know, I'm not being paid, okay? I didn't come here for money. Louis asked me to come and help younger comics. Um, that's how I started. When I started stand up, I was 17. I didn't know shit. I was still in high school. Um, I, uh, I got I won a contest on a radio station, and I got to uh, open up for Sam Kennison. Sam told me to um, move to Houston and do stand up. That's where he started. I did. Uh, I didn't even wait to graduate. I just got my diploma mailed to me, and I went to Houston. Uh, the comedy workshop that he was uh, famous for being a part of. Uh, the Texas Outlaws, the only ones that are really still left are Carl Bo, maybe um, uh, Ron Schock, some of y'all don't know these names, you should get to know them, they're brilliant artists. Uh, other guys, alumni, uh, maybe you know Bill Hicks, came from, um, came from uh, Houston, started there, um, uh, the workshop had closed. Another uh, comedy venue had taken its uh, turn, uh, the Comedy Showcase, Danny Martinez, uh, one of the sweetest comedians I've ever uh, uh, seen perform, uh, taught me how to do stand-up. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I gotta know that um, if, you're, if you're a hobbyist, LA is not the place to do comedy. If you're a hobbyist, go for you, have fun with it, but you gotta understand the animosity that comes from the comedians because you're taking their fucking time. They're taking their stage time. When you don't take it seriously, it pisses people off because they've, there's a lot of people who wait. I remember coming here and, and the first two weeks hardly getting any spots even though I had great times because Eddie Griffin would come in and fucking do an hour and a half. And then Andrew would come in and do another hour and a half. And, and between them, they get seven laughs, and they drive everybody the fuck out. And it was bullshit, all right? So I'm here at one o'clock, barely making my fucking rent, all right? But people who just, with their stroke on their fucking dick, got their spot. It was bullshit. But that's the game. Um, it's not for everybody, okay? You're not all gonna be great comedians. That's just the truth. Um, you, you can have fun. There's, there's certain things you can do to help yourself. Um, write every day. Uh, when you first have, who's, show of hands, who's performed? Stand ups? Okay, alright, pretty much. Alright, uh, anybody more than a year? Okay, two, eight, one, two guys. Where are you from? Orange County. Well, I'm from Eagle Rock now, but I live in Orange County. Okay, how about you, Ricky? I live here. Here in LA? Right. right on. Um, if you've been doing eight years, you're starting to kind of get it. Everybody up until then, you don't fucking know what you're doing. <laughs> you can say, when the joke is in comedy, when um, a young comic tells you they have 20, they have five. Um, when they say they have uh, 40, they have maybe 15. That's the truth, you know? Once you weave out hack and bullshit and stage work, I mean, you might have done 40, but it doesn't mean you have 40. Um, the minutes are, are hard to acquire. Great way to do that, uh, to get them, is uh, know a couple things. Um, number one, uh, write every day. Uh, my favorite TV show is Law & Order. On TNT, I can watch it two times a day. Uh, that's two hours, okay? 
over the course of a week, that's 14 hours. Over the course of a month, that's nearly 60 hours. Okay? Over, the, over a year, that's over 720 hours. It's a lot of fucking time that I didn't spend writing. And you can sit there and, and, you know, everybody waits in this town for something to happen to them to be, instead of being proactive. If you're doing comedy in Los Angeles, you need, for the first 90 days, you have to be in three to four venues doing comedy every night of the week. No let up, all right? No, no dates with the girlfriend unless she's going with you to the clubs. No, uh, uh, I'm going to meet the boyfriend's parents. No, there's none of that shit. If you want to do it, you got to fucking do it. And you got to admit to it. And that's why we're different. Stand-ups are weird. We're fucking weird. We're fucked up. That's why we have to do comedy. We're fucked up. And that's where funny comes from, all right? And the really the only ones that are going to get you and understand the fucking biz are your brethren, okay? White, black, or brown, all right? Can't have fucking thick, uh, thin skin. You have to thicken up, all right? When it comes to uh, stand up, uh, the best advice I ever got was play a game. Every time you go on stage, give yourself uh, five points for a new joke, two points for a tag, and uh, uh, one point for rearranging your material. And the reason you do that is um, like your first five minutes you ever wrote, you. Uh, you went out there and you did it, and you'd never done it in front of an audience before. And then it takes years to get back to that type of bold confidence, okay, that your first five fucking minutes is gonna be great. Do you understand how difficult that is? Now you guys have been doing it for a while. So open your act with a brand new five minutes. Bet you can. It's fucking hard. And you did it the first time. If you do that the first time, okay, if you perform, you know, three nights a week, okay, uh, in LA you have the opportunity to do at least two to three. Let's just say two, okay, two spots at night, all right? And given to the, um, the rise in like ethnic shows, let's say, let's even it off at 10 spots per week. In the course of a week, that's 520 spots. If you amass five minutes of different material every fucking spot, do you understand how much further you can take your comedy? You've written four hours. It's not that fucking hard. You start breaking it down. Comments make our minds prevent us from doing better. We, um, I can't write new things or I can't write this. And, but there's something to be said for living too. You know, you have to live, you have to learn, you know, you have to see people's reaction, you have to become a keen observer, and you have to do, you have to observe things that haven't been observed before. That's hard, it's not easy. But also, do you take every advantage during your day? Are you, are you taking acting classes in LA? All right, I've got a bunch of, uh, I'm, I'm EP in a TV show, myself, I'm a Bell Crawford, all right? And I've got execs at Comedy Central asking me if I can fucking act. You know why? Because they've given tons of money to comics that can't fucking act. Now, I tell them I've been taking acting lessons since 99, okay? They don't give a shit. The reason I did that, I took them when I couldn't afford anything. You know, I would take them out of the back of the Backstage West there's those uh, fucking uh, Edward the Cult School, the Church of Scientology shit, okay? They've got those, all right? And uh, they're like 15 bucks. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. They're like 15 bucks. And then at the end, they try to, you know, <laughs> want to lay the mojo on you with the fucking IQ test. Spitzville, okay? Say, hey, I gotta go put change in the meter. Pew! Get the fuck out. <laughs> but take them for the fucking information. Because whether they're a whack job or not, that's the, the industry, and they're in it, okay? Sometimes it's a stroke fest. Sometimes the best things you'll get out of a class, even this one, is associations with your fellow comedians. That's why this class had to be formed. If Kyle and Louie hadn't invented it, it needed to be done. Because there's no solidarity. Comics aren't sitting with other comics. All young comics know fucking everything because they do a different type of comedy that doesn't require punchlines. <laughs> and that's great. 
If that's what's floating your boat and you're making money with it, that's great. Last year I made $1.2 million. This year I plan on making about 1.6. Right? And how I did that was, yes, through a launch of a TV show, but I didn't even fucking win. I didn't win the TV show. I came in second. The guy who won took two years off of comedy and was working at SeaWorld in a fucking action adventure show. That's true. Okay, Hugo, you make that up. No, if I made it up, I would say PF checks. <laughs> is single, okay? That's the truth, all right? Why did I pop and why did he not? Why did I pop and why did he not? He had the more votes, he had this, but I've been doing stand-up comedy for 14 fucking years at the time. I knew my way around the microphone. I did. And I knew jokes. I had been headlining since 92, 93, you know, and, and, and I, mine was a baptism by fire, okay? If, if you guys in L.A. want to learn comedy, doing it in Hollywood and over at the fucking coffee shops and shit, ain't going to do it. Nobody's ever been launched from the fucking coffee shop. It's never fucking happened. Garofalo tries to say she was, that bitch was a comedy workshop comic. That's a fact. It's been launched from comedy clubs. Sweat on the stage with Richard Pryor. Okay? You understand? You, you put in, you got to go where real comics are. And you got to go where real audiences are. All right? People who are snapping and into their fucking hippie shit, that's not going to be a good judge. It doesn't represent the, the fucking 264 million people who don't live in LA or New York. You know, you have to. You know, you can go for the coolest one here, but does that translate? Not really, not really. Um, I think that it's vital for you to understand. These, um, there's rooms around LA that you can get a lot of knowledge from um, that aren't the big clubs. Um, they're one-nighters, um, get in touch, uh, hang out at Latino night, ask some of those guys if you can go up some of those Mexican rooms. <coughs> People go, Ralphie, why would you ever go to those Mexican rooms? Okay, when I was starting up in LA. Okay, this, I got here in 99. The first night I showcased in the OR for Mitzi, she brought me in here. Okay, one other person had done that, that was Roseanne. Um, I showcased for Jamie. He signed me to manage me. In my first week here, I was getting 25 A room sets a week. Okay, and I hadn't even showcased at the improv because I was too busy. They heard about me and invited me to perform there. That doesn't happen. But I was prepared when I got here. I had a great five minutes. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I had a great eight minute set. I had a great 15 minute set. And I had a great 20 minute set. All right? And all the time, I would hone those sets and I would sharpen them. I would add punchline where there was no punchline. I would add a tag off a look. And I got it to where it was so strong that they couldn't ignore me. To where they, I, when Dan Cook would move to be in front of me, it happened. A lot of people, he did that too. But I was the first one after he did a standing ovation. I'd give one to. And not many people were doing that. It was hard, okay? But it's because I had all this knowledge from old time comics that it helped me out. And I worked hell gig after hell gig, doing show after show after show. Now, when you, um, young comics um, are always. Um, young comics um, are too verbose. You use too many words. The spoken word is a lot shorter than the written word. Okay? The way to eliminate the slag out of your act is uh, take on a regular uh, news uh, notebook and then write a line from your act and then skip three uh, lines and write another line from your act all right? and do that all the way. 
and then go back and take out every unnecessary word to make the point happen, to make it shorter. You all can do this. Very rarely do comics, you know, under 10, 15 years have every word of their act down. Very, very rarely. Okay, you can take out a lot of unnecessary, and you're gonna lose time, yes, but you're gonna get stronger. You're tightening up your material. Um, do you know how to construct the act? Do you know how to do your set? Okay, your, your number one joke is your closer. Okay, that's the end, all right? Leave them laughing. Your second joke should be number one. And try to make it an introductory joke. Express who you are in the first 30 seconds. People will like you or dislike you quicker than 30 seconds. And if you're good, you're smiling, how to tell a joke, smile. Unless it's your thing to be fucking mad all the time, Smiling is better, okay? Because when, you're fr when your friends are telling you a funny story and they're giggling so hard that they can't get the fucking story out, okay? All right? And they're smiling at you and you're working up and you're like, okay, you find yourself like, okay, motherfucker, what? What? Oh my God. Right? You're already halfway there. You've already got them halfway there. It's so easy to push them just a little bit more. Young comics are always afraid of silence. Silence is great, okay? It builds drama, but it's a great cheat. You can cheat your way into getting higher laughs per minute with silence. Jack Benny made a career of it. What you do is, right before the punchline, you pause. So you have your lead up, and then a pause, and the audience will hear that pause, and they're just as nervous as you were you were filling every pause with ahs and mm, ah, 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 and ah, 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 all that shit. And they'll laugh at it. Or they'll applaud at it. It's fucking crazy. But that's what they do. And then you hit them with the punchline. The reason they'll laugh is they'll, make, they'll see your punchline. Since you brought them to this point, they'll see it, knowing your character and how you're going to react. All right? And they laugh once. And then you do the punchline. And then they laugh again. So you just doubled your last per minute. When you can't write new material, um, work with what you got. Take your jokes. None of your jokes are ever finished. If you think they're finished, you're finished. Get out of the biz. They're always under construction. That's why it's so fucking hard for comedians to record things. Because we know every joke is always evolving. It's always getting funnier, longer, better, more complex, more tags, more, more tie-in facts, more, I mean, you know, you can draw these illusions, okay, back to it, different asides inside the piece, okay? You know, you can take really long, you know, uh, cutbacks to, to have a story go in one direction then it comes all the way back, all right? You should look at it as a physical model, okay, or a diagram, all right? your punch and then your tags, where to pause. Uh, a guy that you probably never heard of, uh, his name is James Gregory. He trademarked funniest man in America, okay? And he's a southern guy, all right? And last year, James Gregory made $2 million. Yeah, it got your attention now, huh? You never fucking heard of him. He's been doing it for years. You know what kind of car he drives? About an 82 Cadillac piece of shit. And he just carries home big old bags of money. Lives in Atlanta, never drives to every one of his gigs, doesn't, doesn't deal with any of these fucking half bags, okay? That you're gonna make your fucking life fucking sick, okay? Just flat out fucking half bags, okay? Guys that aren't even fucking man enough to be gay, alright? You know what I mean? They just have to fuck you, okay, and be an asshole about it. And this town's chock full of them. Chock fucking full of them. Be prepared to be disappointed. That's what this industry does. Comedy's fun, okay? This industry takes the fucking fun out of it. And they put fucking drama into it. 
you, you, if you're in LA, you've got all these little cliques and shit, and oh, I'm not in with those people, or those people have a beef over some fucking joke. Guess what? Turtle, lift your head up and look on the other side of the fucking pond, and there's somebody doing the exact same fucking joke. It wasn't your joke, it was there for anyone. So many times, comedy, comics try to be comedy police. They try to fucking, you know, go after everybody, all right? And all you're doing is wasting your fucking time. You're worried about what everybody else does, and you're not doing what you need to do to make yourself better. Appearance. If you don't have a character, like you're just you, okay, hats are distracting, <coughs> okay? They cut off your face. They cut off you, um, uh, if, they put, if they cast a shadow on you, um, it's, it's going to be bad because you get a lot of your comedy from your eyes. Um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's back, it cuts off like all the crinkles and stuff. You can get inter interesting texture in your face. And you can bring people in. You can tell a story. It'd be more believable. Because a clean face, I don't know why, but it denotes uh, suspension of disbelief. It, um, where people with beards, goatees, long hair, that's why a lot of female comics pull their hair back. It's because it opens their face up and makes them more, more believable. If you can believe, if you can suspend the disbelief in your audience, they're halfway to believe in any fucking story you want to tell them. Anything. Okay? But these distractions, you know, the, no, you, you can't understand the gist of what I'm saying or how I'm saying it if I'm covered up with a beard. That's why nobody on TV has them. That's why politicians don't have them. I don't, it's weird, you know. 300 years ago, everybody had to have a beard. All right? Now, it's just the opposite. If people do, people don't believe them. That's why it's not, they don't let that shit go on TV. You know, no main guy on television has beards, right? And especially in comedy, because they're not believable. Same with presidents, all that shit, right? It just is. Um, let's see. Joke, 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 joke. Oh. Great one when uh, you start working, okay? And uh, this is a really good one. Um, don't drink at the clubs. Don't get high at the club. Don't get high before your show. Don't get drunk before your show. The reason when you're working out in America, okay, where you're doing like an opening feature, a hell of a gig, okay? Not just a showcase room like here in LA. If you're an opener, you're making 300 a week. Okay, that's like seven shows, four days. All right. If um, the club owner he goes, yeah, yeah, the drinks are on us. All right. And let's just say you have two beers, seven shows. That's 14 beers. Now the actual cost is less than 15 dollars with taxes. Okay, that the club has to pay, all right? Not that much. But in the club owner's mind or the club manager's mind, you just cost them, um, you know, that's about uh, 12 to $14 worth of beer in the average comedy club, okay, per show times seven. So you went from a $300 act to a $450 act, okay? And they won't have you back. If you can't get booked back, you're dead. If you can't um, uh, find new venues to work in off the venues you already have, you're never going to grow. Okay? I'm already booked into um, May of 2011. Okay? That's, that's how it goes. Right? It's because over 20 years, I've never gotten fired. Okay? Come close. I've come close by breaking some of my own rules. Um, don't fuck the staff. Ever. Ever. People go, oh, that's your. Why would you include that? This is the class about comedy. Well, it's also about the business of comedy. Okay? In the business of comedy, your co workers are 
waste staff, bar staff, kitchen staff. Um, everybody else is having a good time. This is your work environment, all right? If you want to excel in a corporate world, you don't fuck your secretary. You will lose your job. It's the same with comedy. I'm going to tell you a story, and at the end I'm going to tell you who it's about. Right. <laughs> in uh, must have been 1995, I was working at the Laugh Stop in Houston, Texas, and uh, the headliner, funny guy, country guy, right, was getting shit faced, and he fucked the fat head waitress and um, uh, a manager. Okay, fucked. All right, and she, this this big girl, big girl, nice big girl. Okay. The next day he comes in still loaded. He's um, he's. I saw him buy an eighth. Of, I mean, excuse me, an eight ball the night before, and he was asking me for the guy's number again. All right, so he burned an eight ball in about 24 hours. That's getting it done, son. That's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people check. And then uh, he was taking pills, and he was doing a bunch of shit, and uh, he's getting fucked up before the show, telling everybody, all the comics, myself included, we're all laughing at his fuck stories about fucking the fat wa uh, waitress. And he thought it was so funny that he went up on stage and did those jokes. Yeah, what a dick, right? The girls in here are going, <laughs> All right. Well, he got his come up about two days later when uh, that same waitress got a promotion, and she was booking um, eight out of the um, nine A rooms in Texas. Okay, and Baton Rouge too. Okay, so she controlled where he lived. It was now a 16 hour drive to any work that was of substance. Within two years, that same guy was out of comedy. He was living uh, south of uh, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and had bought, with his last bit of money, a, um, uh, a pottery factory was making pottery. And he called me up in 87, heard I was coming to town, and told me to bring weed. And uh, and I'm like, are you kidding me, dude? I'll be the only one who ever brought weed into Mexico. <laughs> and um, he called around, and some of his old buddies took mercy on him after he agreed to clean up a little bit and do clean material. And they took him on board and let him start because he had he was exceptionally funny, exceptionally funny, and he was a, a, a great comedian. But he was a classic fuck up. He had to do every drug harder than everybody else. He had to um, drink everything. Had to fuck as much as he could, and it it got him out of comedy. And not just the mere charity of his friends got him back. That guy was okay. Fucked his career up. That guy makes over a couple years ago. He's making twenty million a year. Now he's probably making ten. Jets, shit like that. Okay, or a fucking pottery factory because he fucked the hell. You don't fuck the staff. It's bad news. You want those people to be your friends, okay? And if you fuck them, what happens is, yeah, you might have both said it was just a, hey, no strings attached, whatever, all right? But it comes back to fucking haunt you. Because they'll, somebody will get their feelings hurt, or you'll fuck somebody else the next time in town, and there's jealousy. And then, when the club owner's talking about comics they like, that waitstaff ain't talking about how much they like you and how you can get back in there. And that's a big fucking deal.
Those people have the ears of the people who make the decision. Don't shit where you eat. Um, female comics, don't fuck comics. <laughs> okay, don't fuck them. You know why? Because I don't care how good you are, if you fuck them, and you fuck more than one, nobody ever fucking forgets it. And I don't care how much famous you get, how many fucking albums you sell, they'll all say, oh, she fucked that person. That's where she got her act from. I know four girls, people say that about now. And these girls make millions of dollars. And people shit bag on them. They never just can let it happen. Right? And girls, you have to thicken your fucking skin up. Comics are gonna fucking shit bag on you. They're gonna be mean to you. They're gonna call you cunts. They're gonna fucking do all this shit. And guess what? They're just trying to get you out. If you have a relationship and it's not really fucking solid, comedy will take it away from you. I don't care. It's very hard to have a civilian wife. When you're fucking over here and you're the star over there, People get jealous. They get jealous and they get fucking, they get crazy shit going on in their head. Whether you're doing it or not, you know, they're gonna fuck. It's gonna be bad, all right? Comedy is a brutal, brutal art. It's brutal. On marriages, relationships, health, physique, I mean, it, it's brutal, okay? That's the nature of the biz. Um, What else? Louis, what do you think? Well, you know what? Just a couple of things that I was going to ask you that you were talking about. Okay. Um, so, we lost when you came in second. Uh huh. Or lost, however you looked at it. I don't know. Right. No, um, I just came in second. I don't give a shit. Right. But at the time, did it have any effect on you in the way uh, that? Things in my life would that affect on me like that, where I lost the game. You know, you know, did you lose anything in that, or did you get stronger? I think I gained from it, to be honest. You know, I think everybody was expecting me because I was just in shock. You know, I'd done the guy had done basically the same, you know, eight minutes because he only had fifteen, and and it snowballed everybody, right? But I also knew the score going in. I knew the business behind the business on Last Comic Standing. It's not an even playing field, as probably some of y'all have experienced. You've gone down there and dealt with that shit. Um, at the time, I was over 650 pounds, and NBC had never had a person that big, ever. Jay Moore told me, because we had, we'd worked together and we were friendly, um, that um, uh, basically NBC wanted to get rid of me. Um, they thought the show would be mocked because of me, and um, I had to get a standing ovation every show, is what Jay Moore told me, to make it where they couldn't get me out. And so that's exactly what I did. I got a standing ovation every fucking time. And I was shocked, you know, when it happened. But I kind of knew it was going to go down, okay? I kind of saw the writing on the wall. How could they give a production deal to somebody 650 fucking pounds? What the fuck angle are they going to take? I wasn't functional. I wasn't healthy. I hadn't done everything I should have done to prepare myself for starting. Like, and this business can come at the corner. Anything. It can come around any corner, anytime. You can be at a club hanging out. Don't even have a spot. You're hanging out. Somebody doesn't show. They don't have another comic. You go up. And there's a guy in there from NBC, or CBS, or Showtime, or HBO. It happens all the time. All the time. Or, better than that, uh, the secretary, or the, um, the mistress is there, or um, uh, the, the husband, or the, whoever is there sees it, the lover of the executive, and they tell them about you, and how funny you made them. All right? That's big, okay, and it can happen anytime. Hang out, hang out, okay, get in the know. Become friendly with other comedians, and they'll usually give you this advice free of charge. But when I lost, or came in second, whatever, 
I, I immediately remembered what happened to Motley Crue when they lost the first heavy metal Grammy in 88 to Jethro Tull, a band that plays a flute. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in response to that was that it, it, it actually, I think I lost because my fans thought I had it wrapped up. Even if it was, I mean, I don't even think it was really real, to be honest with you. I don't think the voting was real. But what happened was, is that it, they, it got them so pissed off that then I got robbed, that they became even more of my fan, okay? And in doing so, my first album, Just Correct, went platinum. I've had uh, two other subsequent albums go platinum. That ain't bad for you. Um, you know, it, it was, those are good, you know, good numbers. And I'm, I'm, I'm selling out everything around the country. You know, I'm doing theaters in September that already have tickets. These are late September dates, and my tickets are already over a grand in <coughs> Valley, in Bakersfield, Stockton. What? Nobody does that. Okay? It's not easy. But I also do radio every chance I can get. When you get an opportunity to do radio, fucking do your best material. Your best. I don't give a shit what jokes you have. You do the best shit you've got. At that moment, you be as funny as fucking possible. Okay? And don't stop. When they're laughing, keep on pouring it on. Give them every fucking joke you can. Here's why. A lot of comics don't do this, and the reason they say they don't do it is because they're nervous. If I tell my best jokes on the radio, then the audience that comes won't laugh at those jokes, and those are my best jokes. Well, who gives a fuck about the 300 here when 300,000 just heard you on the fucking radio? Those 300,000 are the ones who are going to buy your fucking albums because something's in their life, they couldn't get a babysitter, work was too much, bills are tight, I can't afford 25 bucks you know, uh, per person, that's 50 bucks for me and my girl, that's, and then drinks, this bitch has a $12 beer, bitch, you better drink that beer. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, they add it up and they go, but I can spend 20 bucks on Amazon and get a DVD. Okay, and you just still sold product. And then when your DVD goes to them, they like you in this much, they're gonna like you in this much, and then they're gonna come spend their fucking dollars. I have people come up to me, I've seen you 12 times. You never do the same jokes. I don't. Because I have a commitment to my audience. I am uh, I'm Southern. I was, I was not raised with any money. Um, it was uh, hard, and I know the value of a fucking dollar. Um, when uh, I lived in LA, I worked off of the uh, off the clubs. Here, fifteen dollar <coughs> spots in the OR. Like Jamie's, forty dollars. They got bumped up to sixty. Improv still probably owes me fucking twenty five hundred, motherfuckers. <laughs> but I also sold weed. Okay, I'm not gonna bullshit you. It was never a full gram, but it was always good weed. <laughs> I sold it right in that hallway. I sold it in the front over here. I sold the shit over back here in the, in the piano room. And I had my clientele. I had my clientele. And I, through that, I made a ton of connections. I made a ton of fucking connections. It got me with a lot of people that propelled my career. Because I made myself indispensable, I made myself readily available, and always fucking funny. And I would go do stuff for free. Well, I had a buddy who was working a sports show on, on the Fox lot on Sunday morning. That means on Sunday I got up at fucking 6 a.m. and drove over there, had breakfast with him, wrote a ton of jokes about sports stuff that was going on that day for football, and he killed. He got a big contract, even though I had done it for nothing and not expecting anything, just the experience of writing jokes and that pressure and that environment, being around TV people, he gave me $25,000. The same week my engine on my car blew out. I mean, it, it's just, 
it's crazy sometimes how the business works. You have to work for it. If you're expecting money and comedy, you're retarded. Get out. Okay? If you came here with some pie in the sky fucking dream that, that you take this course and then in two years you're making a million dollars, it's not gonna happen. Alright? It's not. Alright? You can't prepare for that. What you can do is, as a comic, we have our days open. If you want to aspire to TV things, you all have a look, you all have a personality. Every one of you could be taking a commercial acting class, okay, and going in on commercials. I can't tell you how many times there's a commercial place in uh, Santa Monica, okay, off Bundy, that, uh, that has at any time, all times of the day, 8 to 12 commercials casting. Five days a week I was down there reading the sides for everybody. I wasn't submitted by anybody, but I auditioned for every fucking role. I got something. Got a couple of nationals, and that shit fucking moves you forward. You just try to stay on. If you're here in LA, get a fucking job. Get a job, make your fucking bills, clean your house up, all right? Live like a fucking human, and go out <laughs> and take the, take the gigs in order, in business. Don't drink, don't get fucked up. Stay a little bit, have somewhere else to go, all right? Talk to other comedians. Okay, where's the spot? Where are you going? Oh shit, for real? What's that? Have you been doing any good shows lately? What's the what? Where's the where's the good spots? All right, and you can you can get it hooked in. Okay, I remember guys would take me and and I would do seven spots in a night, and I was just like, what? I didn't know these shit existed. Like all the Mexican rooms, holy fuck, those Mexican comics got their shit on lock. Every one of them's got two or three rooms. <coughs> I can't tell you how many times Jeff Garcia saved my fucking life. He goes, April, you want to work? Yeah. All right, I've got uh, Monday in Montebello, um, Tuesday West Covina, Wednesday Rosemead, um, Corona on Thursday. Just a little bit of south side of L.A., in L.A. County. Motherfucker. All right, that was a bullshit drive. Okay, uh, uh, the fucking casinos, um, the, the Hustler Casino, shit like this. They're all doing comedy, okay? You don't have to do all these fucking poetry reading fucking uh, coffee shops, okay? You can find a real audience, okay? You can find, you can find something, okay, where you can actually be you, okay? Now, the reason that a lot of comics get mad at cussing, okay, that, that comics who curse uh, to get laughs, um, once you learn how to write dirty, you can never write clean. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. It never fucking translates. All right? If you learn to write clean, you can always go dirty. All right? Now, the reason you write clean and you have clean jokes in your act, if you do get a TV spot, what you gonna tell them? You're telling them your blowjob piece and then your fucking double penetration fucking closer? <laughs> about eating pussy for five minutes on Jay Leno? I don't think so. I don't fucking think so. Sucking cock? No. Tampons? No. It's not gonna fucking fly. You have to have clean material. Because you have to do it on television. There's also something else nobody will tell you about. When you do a fucking show for Comedy Central, you want the whole fucking text of what you're saying to be bleeped out? Because they fucking will. They'll bleep it off. You want to lose 400,000 400, units sold because they won't put it in Walmart? If you're dirty, they won't go in Walmart. If you're clean, you can work NACA, okay? When you're, when you're not a known act, okay, you're not a specialty draw, and you're like a $1,500 to $2,500 act at these colleges, you got to be clean. And if you're not, you're not gonna get your fucking check. And they're gonna be pissed. And you'll never work. Those college communities tighter than comedy community. And they'll tell everybody. They'll send out an email. This guy was so blue, people were offended, we had to write letters, okay? You'll never work in that industry again. All right, and you're trying to move forward, all right? You have enough against you. Okay? You really do. I mean, 
your, your, your comics, okay? We are the least respected art form. Arguably the hardest. And we do it ourselves. We don't have a writer, we don't have a director, okay? We're not, we, we usually don't have good lighting, okay? All right? All you got is you, all right? And you make it by everything, all right? It's important that you understand that, that it is art, okay? And while it's not, it doesn't translate, that's the problem. To be, to see the painting, you have to be inside the painting. You have to be in the audience, in the backstage, see, seeing it happen live, all right? That's how you can see the art. It, it doesn't translate on DVD, CD, none of it. You can still get the joke across, but it's not the what it fucking really is in the room. And that's why it's least respected, because you can't document it. You know? Um, uh, let's talk hack. Um, don't do it. Don't fucking rip off people. Don't rip off other comics. Don't rip off ideas or premises. It's bad news, man. When it comes back to you, it will be hell. Does anybody know where Carlos Mencia was playing two years ago? Sold out Universal Amphitheater. Sold it out. 28 times in a row. Two shows a night for two weeks straight. Sold the fuck out. When he was in, um, we have two houses. We have one here and one in Nashville. In Nashville, two years ago, he played the T-Pack Center, okay? Which was uh, 4,500. Sold it out, added a second show, showed that out. It's 9,000 seats. One night. Now he's coming back to Nashville. He's playing Zanies, a 280 seat room. And he hasn't sold out the first show. How far did they fall? I really think that shit Rogan did really fucked him up. And whether it was right or not, it happened. And it's brutal. I'm not going to get into any of that shit. I don't like it. Me, I've eliminated being around comedians. It's the most you're going to see me talk to anybody. Because I don't want to be around. If you get, uh, if, whether convicted or not, of theft when you're a comic, the inference is enough to kill your career. Because in this business, you are guilty when accused. And then it's your job to um, prove your innocence, if possible. And people are still going to believe what they fucking want to believe. And you will lose your career. You will not have one. You get so much off of this industry, off other comics. You'll have your life uh, beheld into it, right? If you fucking, the only people that get you and you become an outcast, it's a lonely fucking place. Me, it can't be theft without opportunity. So I just don't watch any other comedians. I work with four people. My wife is one of them. Because I don't care. I don't do it for the back of the room. If you're trying to make the back of the room laugh, and all the comics, and have a respect amongst your, your ilk without respecting what the audience wants, get out. Get out of the fucking way. Your job is to make people laugh, okay? Painters don't paint so other painters can go, wow, that's great painting. Painters paint to fucking sell the art, okay? That's what professional means. Your job is to make people fucking laugh. Try not to save the world. Whenever you're angry and you're, whenever you're trying to make a point, all right, people don't like being spoken down to. They just don't. They don't like it. You know, they uh, they don't care. Um, what other jo stories do you want? Uh, just, you know, I just had two other things, and then if you want to let me ask questions. Sure, sure, sure. But just one thing, just the, just the writing thing, uh -huh. where you had the game that you played. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time you went up and you did a new joke, you got three points. Five points. Five points. And yeah. Two points. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one point, point for rearranging your material. 
reason you do that, it, it helps build segues, new segues. Anytime you can go at a joke from a new angle, there's a new possibility for comedy there. Um, try to get a minimum score of 12 points on that scale, and um, you will, uh, in a year, you'll have 30 minutes. And then the, the other writing question I had for you was, uh, do you write um, literally the joke out? Uh, I never have. I, I don't know what it is. I, uh, I have a great memory, and so I can do jokes. Right now, I've got about 12 hours of material in my head, and you can, when things happen, having that catalog, I can go back to, so it'll look like an improv, but it's a four minute bit that I wrote in 98. And, and people go, holy shit, why did you pull that out of your ass? And you don't tell them, yeah, I came over 12 years ago, right? It was, it was funny then, it's funny now. I just got a new thing to talk about, you know? Um, the, the writing is difficult. When you, I'm a topical comedian. When you write topical, jokes are great, and then they fall off. The, the great thing to do is take a topical joke and then become the quintessential topical joke on that subject. Like when JFK Jr.'s plane went down, I had eight minutes on that before they got the plane off the fucking uh, seafloor. Because I knew it was a race to have the quintessential thing. You know, I, I said that um, the happiest person when this plane went down was Daryl Hannah, his ex-girlfriend. She was so happy. She was like, I'm glad that motherfucker didn't marry me. And I said, that's fucked up because that bitch is a mermaid. She could have saved his life. <laughs> okay? And you take it that far and go a different way. And you say something so wrong. And you become the quintessential bit on it. Okay? And then you become a landmark. That's what Carl used to do. Okay? That's what rock does. Okay? You become the quintessential bit on that subject. That no comic will even touch it again because there's nothing left to say. When I was talking about Siegfried and Roy, I went from their angle to a guy in the audience going, you know, I can't believe I dropped 250 bucks to see these two German fees. Okay, I'm from Iowa. This is fucking bullshit. Lost, you know what? I wish that tiger would eat that. Oh my God! Okay, all right. That fucking piece, all right? And I took it from the tiger's perspective. I took it from Siegfried and Roy. And then I did uh, pun, pun, pun. Okay? I, uh, I, I, I bring it all the way around, and then, you know, they said that he was just trying to save them like wild tigers do in the, in the wild with their young, if they love them. And I'm like, that's bullshit. That was a man tiger, a male tiger in the wild. You know what they do for their young? They have sex with a female tiger about 60 times in a 24-hour period, then leave having nothing to ever do with their offspring ever again, much like NBA players, okay? I took, I took it all the way here, and then I flipped it, okay? I did that same, that same hook. And in doing so, you go at a joke from every angle. That means right within your, the material you already have. Every joke can be expanded. You can add a new angle, okay? Have you done the opposite? Have you, have you gone forward? You know, bring all points into a subject, okay? Your take and answer other people's questions to the con, okay? If you're pro something, then answer the other sides who might be in the audience, the con of whatever topic you're on, in your joke, right? And you'll get them laughing and them seeing your way, all right? Like I say, I smoke weed for Jesus, okay? And the reason I say that is because it confuses the Christians. I, I, like, I don't like the fact he smokes weed, but he says he does it for Jesus, so I don't know how I feel about that, okay? Now, in doing that, I influence myself with anybody, okay, first I align myself with the uh, portion of the audience that is down for smoking weed or whatever, and at the same time, I raise the awareness of the side of the audience that condemns it and thinks it's lowly. That's how you flip them, okay? You're trying to bring them in. Uh, this is a good piece. All right. Young comics look down. And they say, ah, 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 too much. Okay? Don't bring your fucking notes on stage. Be a goddamn professional. Memorize your jokes. Get your stuff when you're telling a joke. Okay? Set up, set up, set up, punch. Set up, set up, 
punch. Okay, always deliver your punch to the center of the room. Wherever the audience is on the wings, go to the last guy between, like right here, it'd be between him and her. Look right there, all right? And you both think I'm looking directly at you, but I'm not, I'm looking right behind you, all right? To over here, all right? And what you do is you're drawing everyone's attention towards you. Everyone's now looking at you, all right? So they can deliver the joke. They're all focused right here when you deliver the punch. You gotta round them up. They're sheep. Sheep only know two speeds, grays and stampede, okay? If they're laughing, Okay, you get them all going, then they'll all laugh together. That's why they pack the table so close. It's a herding mentality. All right, you're the sheep herder. They're dumb. They don't know what the fuck's coming up next. You do. <laughs> Lead them. Lead them. Don't let them take control. That's what happens when comics get yelled at and heckled. And if they fucking freak and they're not prepared, they get taken down. It's not good. Have, have comeback lines ready. Find what's wrong with you. And you can, you know, I used to, if I came out with a, a red shirt, I would go, I know some of you are thinking, hey, hey, Cooley, man, relax on the red. Okay? I would make the inference before they did. Okay? And in doing so, I endeared myself to them. I took away what they saw as a fault. Some place they could pick. Everybody's got balls when they're in a crowd. You single them out, they'll fuck them, they'll, uh, they'll push out. <laughs> <laughs> Alright? So, can you give me a, a little bit of Use the Kennedy bit. Okay. Um, every time on the news, there's always a special about the Kennedys. And they, every time something happens, they go to these same old white people to hear them go, Oh, the Kennedys, it's such a tragedy. I'm here to tell you that every one of the Kennedys are fucking retards. Every single fucking worthless piece of shit of them. Joe Kennedy had weak sperm and all his offspring are soft skulled. Corky from my vote goes on fucking retards. <laughs> JFK was a fucking idiot. You don't take your mistress to where your wife is, okay? Happy birthday, Mr. President. That's the first rule of how to be a player. <laughs> don't take the bitch you're fucking anywhere near the bitch you married. Word. Alright? <laughs> the day he died, he was a fucking idiot. Okay? No, fuck the hard top. It's a sunny day. Let's take the convertible. <laughs> Back into the left. It's little brother Robert. Hey guys, I know a shortcut to the kitchen. <laughs> Alright? Teddy Kenny. It's okay, baby. I'm a great driver. <laughs> how about this fucking retard? Shh. Shh. Throw the ball. And then I would take the mic and hit my head. Okay? Remember the guy who hit the fucking tree? Alright? And JFK Jr. was a fucking idiot too. Alright? I'm not mad when Darwinism works. Okay? I'm really not. I'm not mad at all. Okay? When uh, he was like, oh, fuck the second day of flight school. I'm a Kennedy. Alright? And you know when that plane went down? You know the happiest person was? Daryl Hannah. Okay? And I do that joke. And the reason I say this is because, look, let's just say it wasn't three rich, white, famous people that went down the fucking ocean, okay? Let's just say, God forbid, because I know black people get emotional, all right? Um, it was three black folks. God forbid. God forbid. I know black people get emotional, all right? All right? Let's ask the same question. Would there be 24,000 people out there looking for the black airplane? Hell no, okay? And I had the audience repeat that to me, okay? Three times, answer, you can play along, okay? Um, would there be 24,000 people looking for the black airplane? Uh, Hell no. Hell no. Not even Sharpton in a rowboat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got them cameras on me, right? Okay, and I make them look at right Then I go, would the government move uh, satellites to help find the black airplane? Hell uh, no. No, they won't give them fucking uh, free cheese. Okay, are you talking where you satellite my ass, okay? Last but not least, would there be nine days of continuous news coverage, 24 hour a day on the loss of the black airplane? 
Hell no, not even on BET. Uh -huh. All of the Kennedys, okay? I'm sorry, I have no sympathy for a president that, um, that gets popped in the head and I don't get a three day weekend because of it. Fuck you, Jack. Okay? And the whole inference is I'm mad that they've been given this fucking, uh, this, this free pass, you know, that they always do stupid shit, people, but they're dumb. Okay, they're technically fucking retards. Every single one of them dumb. Okay, there's a reason they don't live that long. Okay, because life hits them and they're okay, they die. Right? But what at the end I'm mad about is the fact that I didn't get a three day weekend. All right, and in doing so, you take a subject and you become the quintessential bit on something. And in doing so, there's not a comic out there that can really step on. My uh, my thing, without hitting it, okay, without doing something I've already done. I'm finding the same thing out. I'm, I'm a parent, and I can't do anything about my kids because Mr. Cosby is there. Unless something happens specifically with my kids that I can say this is my story with my kid. Everything I do is going to be biting on what he's already done. Um. It's something that came up when I did my Denver airport joke, okay? And airports have been beaten to fucking death, okay? But nobody has the better bit than George Carlin about the airplanes and the flight attendants and, okay, this whole thing, all right? Me, I took Denver airport from a fat guy perspective, saying it's too fucking big, it needs to be edited, okay? It's a 20 minute walk till you turn the corner and go, God damn, that's a long fucking walk, okay? <laughs> I'm with the long shoes for this. Where's a black guy with a golf cart? Black bear with a golf cart, okay? All right, and I took that angle on it, all right? And I, I took from getting off the plane to getting to baggage claim, and I made it fucking eight minutes long. I had callbacks throughout it, and in doing so, I became the bit about that airport. There's nobody else gonna touch it. And I witnessed um, the uh, miracle on the Hudson. We were down at Chelsea Piers when the fucking plane went down. Crazy. And I was stoned. <laughs> now, Chelsea Pierce, if you don't know this, Chelsea Pierce has um, an air and space museum on the USS Intrepid. That's why my wife wanted us to go down there, because she knows a lot of aviation. Okay, I like planes, right? And they have a very special plane there, the SR-71, Blackbird Spy Plane, fastest plane ever we ever told anyone about, okay? Um, fast fucking plane, right? I wanted to go see that. But to walk around and deal with civilians, I had to go get fucking high, okay? And I was coming back, and it was mayhem, and there was cops and everybody. And I go to my wife, and I'm like, "Is this happening to everybody?" And she goes, "Yes. There's a plane in the water." And I'm like, "What? Which one? Which one fell in? They got everything down here. That's awesome." Okay. She's like, "No, stupid. A plane just fucking hit the river." And I'm like, "What?" So I kind of witnessed the miracle of nuts. <laughs> but it became a story, and I was there, and I had the perspective. I knew the, um, the North Hudson Hospital is where they took the survivors. And I said, if I, if I just crashed my plane into the dirty Hudson River, got AIDS, because you get that if you land in that water, okay? you get AIDS, all right? And then someone took me to New Jersey, I'd be like, nigga, throw me back in the river, Jack, okay? <laughs> Fuck Jersey, okay? It's State Flower is a shit diaper by a toe booth, okay? <laughs> All right? And, what, and people go, how can you just get away with saying nigga? I don't make any reference to color, all right? If, if you hung up on words, you're not going to be a success, all right? Write clean, do this, but don't be afraid of any word. Because when you're doing a character, and you're, you're having, if you're talking to another guy, and you're afraid of putting the real words in that person's mouth that they would say, then you're not going to be believable to your audience. When you, when you uh, just on that, so who is, so one, this is the second time I've seen you do this. And this one, just like your act, is fantastically different. Do some of the same stuff, but it's really different. And the thing that I was wondering about is about your point, <clears throat> about your authenticity and your point of view. Have you ever consciously thought about it as you were doing it? Yeah, yeah. I remember I was doing um, BET's Comet View, and um, backstage, I knew the producer, Rashawn McDonald, and everywhere, it, this was like, 
the month after uh, the Kobe Bryant scandal broke out in Denver, and they had on the on the boards, "Don't do Kobe jokes. No Kobe jokes. All Kobe jokes will be cut from the performance because somebody in the warm up had mentioned Kobe Bryant, and this theater full of black people went fucking bananas, and they were booing, and they had to scrap the whole shoot for that." that audience. They had to turn out the audience and wait two hours to the next audience to show the fuck up. And they were living. And I was like, you know what? I can play a save or I can just say fuck it. And that's what I did. I just said fuck it. And I did my Kobe Bryant piece and I did it from the angle and I honestly believed it that Kobe was being fucking railroaded. And I called it like I saw. I, I called it a cracker conspiracy. <laughs> and those black people fucking love me. And that's one of the most requested bits I've ever done. Where I'm talking about, I make the analogy. I go, here, you take a 19-year-old little white girl and a six-foot-eight black man. Okay, of course it's gonna be vaginal bruising and tearing. <laughs> making people laugh without ever using a word. That's one of the great things about that joke, is try to find in your act the place that doesn't need the, the word to get the laugh. Find the place that an action or a look can get you a laugh, and you can increase your laughs per minute exponentially. The, you take the shot, okay? Even if you fail, it's a good story. I was, um, I got booked to do the Tom Joyner morning show cruise. Now, being the only white person on the boat was not off-putting to me. But when I had to follow Jeremiah Wright, Reverend Louis Farrakhan, the stylistics, 20-minute band break, and no one told me that the average age of this audience was close to 70 years old. I got booed before I told my first joke. <laughs> but I was like, fuck it. If I'm going to get booed, I'm really going to get booed. <laughs> so there was 4,000 people there, all right? And they're all black, all right? And I said, uh, um, it's great to be here on the Amistad. <laughs> folks back on the ship. That's what I was doing. <laughs> I get you get <laughs> And they were booing and booing. booing. <laughs> but fuck it. That check cleared. <laughs> Sometimes you're not gonna do great. Sometimes and you know what? So many black comics have retold that story that they've got me credited with telling, you know, the, you know, saying negative people and shit like that. I think I might have let one go, but not much. I mean, not, not as much as they say, you know. I did shut them all down when I said I gave uh, Barack Obama $3,000. How much did you give him? All right, and uh, uh, they were like, oh. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, then I said, uh, I go, black folks, be careful what you wish for. If Barack wins, y'all gotta start tipping. <laughs> <laughs> can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't bitch about the man keeping you down when you're the fucking man. So, it's Rosa Parks said that Dr. King could walk so Barack could run, so your black ass could tip 20%. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I know there's nice black people in the back going, excuse us, Ralphie, we were under the impression it was 15%. And I'm like, that's when black folks started tipping in 93. Y'all could have got in at 15%, but now it's 2009. That's 20%. 2008 is time. Uh, now we need 20%. All right? And uh, guess what, Spix? Tick tock, tick tock. All right, if we get us an El Presidente, y'all could be looking at 32% on the end of your check. <laughs> and they're like, oh, they're booing to the whole thing. And I, I don't care, it's fucking funny, okay? <laughs> I, I said, uh, Asians, no need to rush. No need to rush. All right, and that was the most fucked up part, and yet they thought everything else was, okay? 
that Asian line is the most fucked up part of that whole fucked up joke. All right, because I'm, I just take all hope away from Asian people. All right, in that one fell swoop. I mean, you just you gotta have balls. You gotta live, and you gotta have balls. That's what comedy's all about. And that part of having balls is not being afraid to fail, because you're going to. Now, you can take failure two ways. You can learn from it, or you can be devastated by it, okay? If you learn from it, you go, actually, I think you can learn more from bombing than you can from killing. And you will never kill until you bomb. Because you've got to learn the mistakes. You think drawing the people in, these little tricks, were just given to me? You think that working the mic and, and realizing when you do it that you're talking and you move this out of the way so you open up yourself to the audience was taught? Nobody told me. All right? What you do is you have to fucking do it. You have to do it unless you talk to older comics. That's what you're doing here, okay? So, so are you saying that your point of view, and we can wrap it up, I know you're So your point of view is to really just be yourself, to not worry. Don't like worry. You not worry. You do not care. Yeah, you, you all fly. Okay? You all fly. Every bird flies. Okay? And every now and then, a bird fucks up, hits a glass. <laughs> okay? And they fall. <laughs> if they live through it, they get the fuck up, they ruffle down their fucking feathers, and they take off flying again. All right? That's what happens. You're gonna fucking eat it, all right? Don't worry about it, it'll come. You don't have to look for it, it'll just be there, all right? But if you have friends, okay, and you work with these people, and you write, and you bust your ass, and, and, and don't try to fucking market yourself till you've got something to market. You know, don't, don't work on radio till you have a solid eight minute set that's clean, that's TV friendly. When Roseanne uh, came here, because Louie dragged her from Denver, brought her up here, made you put her on, she blew this place apart, and then she was asked to do The Tonight Show. She didn't have any fucking jokes. She had to rewrite her whole shit in three weeks. She's very fucking lucky. Very fucking lucky. She had a great character, great point of view, good comedy basics, but no one had ever taught her how to write clean. She got lucky. Most of the people under that amount of pressure would have fucking crumbled. But she's a strong bitch. <laughs> but she's fucking funny. And she fucking uh, got a TV show, and she made over a billion dollars. Okay, wrap your mind around those fucking numbers. <coughs> it's hard. What are some of your questions? Y'all are public comments, most of you. What are some of your questions? I know you've got tons of them. Yes, sir. What made you take the, uh, the classes when you first started? I didn't take any classes. They didn't have classes like this. No. Just comics would talk to other comics. It was a tight community, small community. You know, there was no, nothing like this. Yeah. You, you said you took acting classes, yeah. right? Did you think that helped your on stage performance? Because Without a doubt. Because you were doubt. taking acting classes? Yeah, you getting familiar and getting that. comfortable on stage and making acting and acting out a joke, second thought, um, with, without a you know, care or whim or balls, certainly helps. It always does. Yes, sir. Now, if you bomb with certain material, do you scrap that material or do you try to brainstorm that and how to? position into a better market or a better audience and, and tweak it all out or okay when Henry Ford made made his car okay actually in 1918 uh, in the state of Pennsylvania there were two cars registered okay in, in the whole state in uh, November of that year in Pittsburgh they had a head-on collision Okay. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> well, two cars Kennedy's, from fucking state. No, 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 I couldn't say that. They were uh, co-barons and they were racing, okay? And they went around the corner and they smashed into each other. There were no rules, okay? They didn't know. 
Now, would Henry Ford, because that happened, just scrap his whole car? Uh, you, you're not dependent upon the audience for verification of your being funny. If you wait for them, okay, they'll fucking eat you up. They'll turn on you in a second. I'll get you next, brother. All right? They'll turn on you. Okay? If you wait for them to come around to you, they won't, ever. If it's politically incorrect, they will not come around to you. You have to bulldog them into believing the way you believe. All right? And that's, that's the truth. If you, if you wait for them to, to give you your political correctness and acceptance on a piece and you don't call them on their bullshit, you will never... You can't be controversial. You have to be uh, talking about cookies and socks. Okay. So if something flops, don't just kind of put your head down and go. No fucking way. Fuck find out what's funny line. about it, and then fix. Nine times out of ten, it's your performance of the piece. Right. Right. Yes, sir. Um, when you go on stage, how much do you know? Like, have a plan of this is what I'm going to talk about tonight, and how much of it is just seeing what the audience likes? Well, I write really fast, okay, so I don't know if this is typical for most comics, but like right now I have three sets, and um, they're each about an hour 20, hour 30, okay, and none of this stuff has been recorded, I'm going to record it this fall, and um, all three of them are different, and I go, and I have the same closer on uh, two of them, and I have a different one on another one, uh, all clean set for some colleges. All right. The reason I'm doing it that way is so I can sell multiple specials and multiple avenues and revenue streams. Okay, I do that, so I know if it's A, B, or C, and I bring them out and I dust them off every time. Now you can do that on a much smaller scale with your material. You know, you have six minutes. You know, build up three six-minute sets with a closer, and there's your 20-minute set. All right, but have these interchangeable. Okay, and work on them. And know what you're gonna do, all right? And make and tighten every one of them up. You're not writing any new material. Great. Write a punchline. Say the stuff faster. Get less words in the way between the setup and the punch, and make the jokes tighter. You can always work on something. Uh, you say like, you know, eight years in is when you know who you are. But like, the jokes that you did before your eight years in are those still jokes that you like and that you bring back with like your knowing who you are now yeah yeah to some degree yeah you know not all of it shit I mean sure some of it was but not all of it is you know it just varies you know I had a joke about not being able to go see Def Leppard again uh, uh, and I wrote this joke in 89 I said I can't watch them because I just feel like I'm you know being really condescending to the drummer you know because after they kick ass you know, I'm like, yeah, y'all rock, yeah, woo! Look at me use both of my arms, okay? Because he only has one arm, all right? And it was funny then, and and you know, you if I do it on radio or something, people still think that's funny, okay? And you can still do it because they're always doing some kind of reunion tour or some shit like that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you believe it would really make a big difference uh, for me if I shaved my balls? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, hands down. No, no doubt. You got balls enough, little sister. You'd be fine. And the reason is, is because you're not. You you look like you're holding something back. You look like you're like you're not telling the truth. People denote that salesmen don't have beards. I got three of them, brother. Would you say that to him if you knew that his character was a completely shy, nervous character? Like yeah, because character. then that comes off with a beard. Really creepy and pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zach's, Zach's been the anomaly. Okay, but Zach, if you watch his stand up, at about 25 minutes, it all kind of starts to go away. Like, he's, he's a really good actor. All right? Okay, it's his energy. But when he does his act, at about 20, 25 minutes, the wheels start to come off. And I, I'm, I'm not I'm not downgrading. Yeah. I mean, he's he's more well known than I am. All right. But I would present this to you. He had a show on VH1 um, that lasted 20 episodes. Okay, and it was his own show. And the network was all behind it. They'd announced tons of stuff about it. Why didn't it go? He'd been on TV shows. He'd been on a bunch of sitcom pilots that never got picked up. Why is that? You know? Now on the shows that he was on. 
like that that show with that that hot chick. Okay, he played a creepy lab guy. Okay, in um, uh, in Hangover, he played a creep. So yeah, but that's the character he played. You see what I'm saying? I mean that that's what his niche is, but that's also what he was playing. Okay, so he was fortunate to a be funny and b be a talented actor and also be in the right place and happen to be a comic. But as far as the headlining set, we'll start to come off at 25, 30 minutes in. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you think you get a little bit more leeway doing like inappropriate racial material because of your size? I don't think so. I mean, I'm just, it just says I'm more white. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have to, it has to be real, okay? Yeah, See, the, the thing is, is that I was raised around black people, okay? And when I came to LA, I lived with uh, Mexicans, and I did all the Mexican rooms. I mean, Kyle can see, when, when we were working at the factory together, okay, I could do stuff that no other comic but Paul Mooney could do. I was up there saying nigger years before the fucking shit with Michael Richards. The thing, the difference was, is I was funny. That's the, that's the thing. I never forgot the basic rule of comedy, is be funny. In my dealings with, with especially Latinos, is if you sell the truth, no matter how bad it is, as long as it's truthful, they'll give you a pass. And I made a joke about it, okay? That I said, as long as you tell the truth, the worst you'll get from a Mexican is, hey, that's fucked up. <laughs> Okay, is that's exactly what happened. Is that just by exposure and being close to it, I got into the culture and it became from a place of not from malice. You know, the stuff I talk about would probably get a lot of white comments punched in the mouth, but they don't believe it. They don't live it. You know, I, I was, I mean, I remember this is this is this is probably why I'm one of the funny guys I am. Is I was raised white trash in Arkansas, and I remember. During a uh, heat wave in 78, I was six years old, I got my white trash wake up call. I was in my underwears in my kiddie pool underneath a tree that actually had a transmission in it. Right? And my brother, who's seven years older, was, um, was watching me and he was mad because we lived in a shit house. Our house sucked. There were holes in the walls that you could put your hand out that weren't the windows, okay? Right? And like it was all plastic in the winter and in the summer, you know, you get bug bites from bugs coming in and stuff like that. It was, it was a bad house. It was bad. My mom and dad got divorced. My mom didn't get um, alimony or child support. She was raising four kids, 800 square foot house. My brother was in charge. My mom was working. And uh, across the street was a nice black couple and a black family. I played with the oldest boy who was uh, seven. I was six. And. Uh, uh, white picket fence, nice house, but my brother was jealous because their air conditioner came on, okay? Um, and he was like, look at those uppity niggers with their fucking air conditioner. Because we didn't, it was 110 degrees. And I looked at my brother at six, not knowing that that was, you know, that he was just a asshole. Well, I know now, but I didn't know then. Was, boy, listen, I hope someday we can be niggers. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how to express Kool-Aid for them like six or seven times. And I woke up in the hospital. Um, my brother kicked me in the head. And I cracked an orbital bone. I broke uh, my nose. I was concussed at six. And my brother almost got sent to reform school for that. Um, but that's one of the reasons that I'm funny. Is because we, we hope to be niggas one day. Okay? That's, that's the truth. When you're white trash. And it's another basic truth. That there's really... Racism is a hologram in this country. It, it's not real. They, they think it's a big issue, and they try to make it a big issue by, by you know, separating us and, and, and dividing um, the races. But the truth of the matter is, it's really about social economics, okay? It's about poor and rich. If you're rich, you live one way. If you're poor, you live another way, okay? And the majority is poor, all right? But they try to make us like, like we're better than they are. I was white trash. White trash is the lowest rung on America's fucking social ladder. It's it's two below nigger, okay? <laughs> all right, it's only one above wetback, all right? But white trash is definitely the worst. <laughs> definitely the worst, okay? And that's just the truth of the matter. But having that empathy with others and living that experience, I get away with probably a lot more than most people. But I've also gone into that community a lot. You know, I took the opportunity. 
When I started in Houston, one of the places I went up all the time was the hip-hop comedy style, Rashawn McDonald's and Steve Harvey's room, okay? One night, uh, Bushwick Bill from the Ghetto Boys pulled a gun on David Raybon, the uh, MC, and told him to bring the fat white boy back, okay? <laughs> so, you know, shit's happened. But also, you know, open yourself up to every audience. Find the funny in it. I don't care if it's a room full of acidic Jews. There's funny to be said. You gotta find it, all right? Yes? When you um, talk about like learning to write clean, like where starting to like, help, like what tips for starting to write clean? Oh, I'm just, okay, like, don't write fuck or shit. Or, or, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know not to write, but like, I just, I don't know, I just naturally think dirty, so it's right. like, how do you? Well, everybody does. That's, that's what that, that's the fun stuff to think about. But you also think about plain stuff at all the time. I mean, you think about your grocery list. You're not thinking about, you know, a fucking zucchini to shove in your gag. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you think clean, too. You think clean, too. And, and hearing somebody tell you that, that you think clean, too, will get you over a big hump, a mental, a mental boundary people put on us. Oh, I can only write dirty because that's the way I think. Bullshit. You don't just think in one direction. You're more than one dimension. Okay? You're a living person. Okay? And as such, you have intricate ways in your mind. Okay? You can go infinite ways in anything you try. Okay? You can make any joke clean and you can make any joke dirty. Okay? Bill Ingvall made a career out of pussy, cock, and, and uh, fucking jokes without ever saying any of it. You can do it. Buddy Hackett used to go on The Tonight Show and blow the place fucking apart. And how did he do it? Because he would talk about fucking the whole time and never mention it. And everybody was in on the joke. But but he was a genius. So you can infer without it. Right. Infer it, but is inferring right and clean if you don't say to it? To a degree. If it's arable, okay. then they technically call it clean. You know, we've loosened up a lot of the FCC re restrictions. Okay. And um, if you can, you can get close to it, like on, on uh, my special prime cut, I do, I, I talk about men's two favorite gifts, okay? Oral and silence, okay? <laughs> Everybody at oral knows blowjobs, okay? All right, but I bounce all around it without ever hitting. Okay. And that way it can go on shelves in Walmart and it can be played on Comedy Central without bleeps. Okay. So I made a conscious choice of word replacement. But sometimes you can't replace a word. Right. Sometimes fuck is the appropriate punchline. <laughs> right? And don't be, don't be hemmed in on any boundaries, okay? okay. You know, when it comes to writing, your experience is necessary, okay? Not having a great attitude is good. Being a curmudgeon is good. Being pro, very pro something is also good, okay? It depends on who you like, you know? There, there's the David Tell camp or um, the uh, Louis C.K. camp or uh, Dan Cook, okay? You can say what you want about Dan Cook. Dan Cook made a shitload of fucking money and still makes a lot of money. You made a lot of movies, a lot more than I did. All right. What are the differences in those camps? Well, David Tell has spawned a whole generation of knockoffs, like Mitch Hedberg did, okay, and before him Bill Hicks did, Richard Jenny has, Jerry Seinfeld has. Um, I don't have anybody yet, okay. <laughs> Thank God. But they they emulate their style, okay. And they, they come on a very punchline, you know, without going into personal stories, okay? And then you go Dan Cook, who's so whimsical and fantasy, you know, he's bouncing off his fucking place, okay? He's saying the most outrageous, crazy shit, okay? Then you have people who just do punchline setup, like Larry the Cable Guy, love him or hate him, that guy's fucking funny. And, I mean, he's made a billion dollars in the past 10 years. How much you made, you know what I mean? Yeah. That guy's fucking great. Everybody comment the shit bags on somebody, you need to watch your fucking tongue. You watch your fucking tone. That guy's paid his fucking dues. That's why he got rewarded. All right? Yes, sir. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the fact that you uh, obviously wrote a lot of material early on about race and about just like your physical <coughs> size? Did you ever feel at some point like you were sort of getting boxed into just writing about that kind of stuff? And how did you break out of that? That feeling? That Man, you know, um, I I wrote. I wrote, I had a, I was headlining within like a year and a half, because in Houston you could get, um, you know, eight, 15 minute sets a week, okay, without much work at all, because there wasn't that many comics at that time. And I wrote so many jokes about being fat, 
and um, uh, two comics. Uh, one of them is still alive, and he actually um, lives here in L.A. Uh, Dante Garza and a guy named Charlie Shannon. Um, they pull me to the side, and they're both big guys, and they go, hey, man, what do you want to be known as? A fat comedian or a comedian that just happens to be fat? And I, uh, it shook me to my core. Um, guys I respected thought less of me because all I was doing was weight jokes. And so I, um, I dropped a ton of shit, literally. Um, I dropped a lot of jokes. I went back to opening after headline. People were like, what are you doing? I'm trying to work, man. Just trying to fucking work. Trying to get an act. And it was hard. It was ballsy. And then you get on TV, and I do I do one bit about living in the in the uh, in the hood because I lived off Crenshaw and Adams, rather by the Johnny Pastrami's. I don't know if you know what it is. Um, the hood, okay. And uh, and then everybody called me Wigger on Last Comic Standing. Now I did the joke. I performed the joke once. NBC ran the shit out of that. They ran it in all their theatrical previews for the show. They ran it on the commercials. They ran it even when I didn't even do the bit. Okay, as, as part of I just done the bit. Okay, they they focused on where I live. They went. They sent a camera crew to my house. Okay, I got uh, I done BET and K Locos because they were TV shows that wanted me on, and so I did jokes for my audience. Even though I had a lot of other jokes. Um, they label me as a wigger or whatever, okay? And then, um, it was so weird because by the end of Last Comic Standing, I had um, death threats, I had people from white supremacist groups call me a race traitor, but they spelled traitor with a D. <laughs> <laughs> To, 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 it became, I mean, really problematic, you know, where we had to move to a new apartment, you know, we put us up, they had the FBI involved. It was a lot of shit, okay? And, and it's like, I, I'm just telling jokes. What the fuck's the problem? Okay? And then I do a piece because at the time, you know, we were told that Iraq was, you know, the ones that were, that were sponsoring Al-Qaeda and shit, and they had nuclear weapons, they are trying to, you know, give terrorists fucking uh, gas, and I was, they said it was about oil, and I was like, great. I want cheap gas, okay? And I did that whole thing about um, uh, about cheap gas in the finals, and people were like, oh, he totally abandoned his roots, and now he's doing this to him. It's like, I'm multi-dimensional, motherfucker. I'm a human, okay? I have more than one way to think about something. If you don't, you're Glenn Beck. <laughs> right? You have to have other ways of thinking about subjects. Okay? You have to be open. And, and you have to be open to fucking up. And, and people go, oh, he shouldn't have gone political. Well, I don't care, okay? I, I, I know what I did in the room, okay? I know that at, in a four and a half minute set, at two minutes, the audience stood up and gave me a standing ovation. I had to shut the audience down to finish the fucking piece to get another standing ovation. And then they chanted my name for seven minutes. And then Jay Moore made me come out and shut them down. That's what happened, okay? So if I abandon my roots, then good. I don't want to be one thing. I don't want to be a one-dimensional comedian. You know, I, I, I'm, and, and it's probably cost me. You know, if, if I went like, there's, there's another popular, very popular comedian um, who's big, and he does just fat jokes. He does them very, very well, okay? And the guy sells out all around the country. Now, could I do that? Yeah, yeah. And trust me, if I wasn't as controversial as I am, I'd be a lot richer. A lot. If there's a lot more money in that than there is in, um, uh, you know, being edgy. I know a guy that's so fucking edgy, he doesn't even work comedy clubs anymore. All right? And he doesn't want to. does it out of uh, his own want. All right? And, and because of that, this guy, you know, he, he's never going to have the success, but he's got everything he wants. Sometimes people are waiting on a bus they hope never comes, you know? Some people don't want to be the best comic of all time. Some people just want to tell their fucking jokes. And that's cool, man. That's fucking cool. I don't like hobbyists, but if you are who you are and you're true to that and you're fine and doing whatever you do as best as you can, then you can't really fault it. By the way, chick comics, you got a lot, road a lot harder than men, okay? You gotta toughen the fuck up. 
My wife's a comic, all right? It's hard, all right? Very hard. Yes? Uh, what do you say to people? Because actually, meeting a lot of people around the world, a lot of people are from different areas. I mean, we're from Miami, there's people from New York, Jersey. I mean, what do you say to people that aren't, you know, in the market of that? That fine, okay, I started comedy in Arkansas. My town had 3,700 people in it. I drove 110 miles to Fayetteville, uh, or to Little Rock was 100 miles, to do everything, everything I could do to do comedy, before they had comedy clubs. Find your own success. There are so many paths to the top of the mountain. And your level of success does not necessarily being on TV, and making a million dollars, okay? Maybe it's just making a living. Maybe it's just fucking having an outlet for you being creative. Maybe you're somebody that's in a relationship and, and seeing your kids grow up is more important than being the funniest fucking guy. And a lot of people it is. And those people are successful, all right? You, you can't measure it yourself, but you also cannot be, you know, you cannot give yourself a reason to fail. If you bitch and you moan and you know I don't have this, I don't have that. There's not a great comedy club where I live. Well, fuck you. Quit. <laughs> fuck you. Get the fuck out of our way. Because trust me, there's somebody out there who wants it more than you do. I'm not the fucking funniest person. Okay? I'm not the funniest person here. I'm not the funniest person in LA. I'm not the funniest person but when I take the stage, and my mentality is, I am the funniest fucking person in the world. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've done it in Laramie, and uh, I'll go out to Comedy Voices Denver, Colorado. It'll be yes, a six-hour drive for three minutes on stage. Right. It's three one way, three back. It takes all night, but it's my job. Yeah, right? And also, be proactive. Comics that are successful, Make your own success. Make you a room that can fucking do comedy. I don't care if it's a pizza place, I don't care if it's a bar, whatever. If you've got to build a stage, it will cost you about 40 bucks to get the stuff from Home Depot to build a fucking stage. For an investment of $300, you can have income coming in. You know, you have, uh, you talk the bar into having a comedy night, and you'll book it with a headliner, a feature act, and you open and get somebody a guest set Right? You could charge them $500, $600. You put out only $300, and you're making $300 a week extra. That's how you get by. You do four of those in a week, you're making $1,200 a week from comedy. And you're giving work to a lot of other people that will get you in turn more work. Pretty soon you won't even be able to do work in your own rooms. They'll be self sufficient. You have other guys, you'll be giving them $25. You're still making $200, $300. Right? And they'll love to have the money. But be proactive. Make your own success. If you are in an area that doesn't have a great comedy venue, you make one. People want to laugh everywhere. And don't tell me shit about recession this and recession that. Let me tell you what, in recession, comedy booms. It doesn't bust. When things are good, nobody gives a fuck. When they're fucking, uh, when times get shitty, that's when people want to laugh and that's when people go to Jesus. Both places, they're spending money. <laughs> yes? How do you order your set? How do I order my set? Um, I try to build a suspension bridge, okay, and make the line instead of any loops. I try to make it a straight across. I come up, first joke to last joke. I try to make a straight line in laughter. I um, punch, punch, punch. I average about 14 uh, laughs per minute. Um, that's a lot more than most. Uh, and I do that and when I perform for about two hours. Yes, ma'am. Um, as an American comedian, what are your thoughts on Canadians coming into the American scene? Great, great. Canadians have a different sense of humor. They have a different system up there. Um, they don't work the um, headliner feature and uh, uh, opener like we do. The opener up there does uh, 40 minutes total, 20 minutes to start off, 10 uh, between uh, the feature and the headliner and uh, another 10 at the end. He's like the host of the whole show. The headliner does 40 minutes and the feature does 20. It's weird. It's a weird system. Um, but I think it kind of reflects 
what I think in comedy is that um, the opener is the most important part of the show. When you're opening, you get paid the least and you're the most important part. When you tell your jokes, you fucking present them, and then whether you bomb or you kill, you do your fucking time. Okay? If you're killing so much, shut it down. All right? And then once it goes to, uh, once you're bringing up the next act, you be a commercial. If the club wants you to mention fucking drink specials and fill out forms for fucking marketing, you do exactly what they say. All right? Don't be a dick. Get everybody's name correct. Don't be an MC and forget somebody's fucking name. It's disrespectful to you, to them, and the art. You have no place. If you can't remember somebody's name, get out of the fucking business. Because those are people that are going to make your career. You better learn their fucking name. There's people in here that will help you in your career. There's people here right now that in five, ten years will go, Hey, remember that fucking fat guy came in and talked to us? Yeah, well now I'm producing him on a show. Or I'm, I'm, I'm writing for it on this show. Or that thing. Okay? Don't let yourself have any reason to fail. Okay? Don't be limited. All right? Canadians come in and make people laugh. They have a different sense of humor. It's a drier, more British type of comedy. Stand-up comedy around the world is about 20 years behind where we are. Okay? That's good because you know what's coming. They haven't really had a British um, alt scene pop up yet. The comics there still do punchlines. Okay? Canada, it's a drier, it's a more polite comedy. There are more polite people. Australia, maybe 25, 30 years behind us. Eddie F's a god there. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Anybody have any other questions? Yeah? You are saying like, uh, you know, Australian comedians are behind. What about like comedians like Jim Jeffries, for example? I don't know if you know him. Yeah, 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 I know Jim. Like, he seems pretty like up to date with the way things are here. Like, really? Well, like, it's in humor, you know what I mean? Like, he's still got that, like... He's raw. Yeah. He's raw. Yeah, okay, raw. but he watches stuff. They're all drinking fag, dick, and poop jokes. That's what they are. Okay? That shit was chic here in the States. 88, Sam Kennison, Bill Hicks, Andrew Dice Clay. I, not, not Bill Hicks. I mean, Bill did a lot of drug stuff, but... He's, we still haven't caught up to Hicks. Okay? But it was cool. In the 80s in the States, every comic was on blow. I mean, if you had to go back here and look at this fucking uh, table on the fucking piano. Yeah, so many razor marks on that motherfucker. Do you have any idea how much blow was done off that cop Do you have any idea? Yeah. Comedy's a business now. You know, people, the individuals, the ones that excel, um, are doing stories, and some are doing regular punchlines. You know, the most successful comedian in the, uh, that's ever been is Jeff Foxworthy. Okay? He doesn't do, you know, he does some stories, but he's most known for punchline setup. You know, you're a redneck if. Right? He's translated that into billions of dollars. Yes, ma'am. I am a Canadian. What part? Uh, BC. Okay. Have you ever done a show in Canada? I have. I've yeah. done uh, Yuck Yucks in Toronto. All the Ontario rooms from Kitchener um, to Hamilton, um, uh, Niagara, um, I've done all those. Um, I've done Montreal, you know, stuff like that. I, 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 like, I like Canadian audiences. It's like a really nice suburb. It's like, it's like a white suburb. I mean, it really is. <laughs> but, but also, you know this, Canadians will stop laughing if you go in too insensitive. They can't fucking take it. They can't take political correctness. I mean, they, they uh, being politically incorrect, rather. They can't take it. The fucking shut down on you. And it's weird. It's weird. I mean, you, you'll be doing a joke, and you'll be saying, like, you know, um, uh, if you see a fat white girl smoking cools, wait a minute, there'll be a half black baby come right around the corner. Okay? All right. Canadian audience will shut the fuck up. All right? They were like, <gasps> they're breathing in. If you shock them, okay, th that's the problem with shock comedy, is that people can't laugh when they're inhaling. <laughs> it's physically impossible. When you shock so much, some of the, <gasps> like this, they can't laugh. 
Their natural inclination at that point is to groan. <gasps> you know what I mean? All right? It's pretty basic. But good for you. You do a lot of work in Seattle and stuff like that? No. No? Get down there. Talk to my buddy Billy Wayne. Okay? Billy Wayne Davis. He's one of my openers uh, that I work with. And he lives in Seattle now. He's a good comic. I teach him this shit, too. Because nobody else would. That's why I come here. I don't come here for money. I don't make any money. I come here out of love for two of my buddies. Okay, they ask me to come and help them. And I want you to get your money's worth. Yeah.